Okay, now well, join me in welcoming Nicole Bailey, who is the Senior Director of Development at All In Together, and she will introduce our first panel. Nicole. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Simone, for hosting an incredible lineup. I am so excited to be here today and a part of the All In Together team. AIT is deeply committed to creating the responsive and representative world we all deserve. Today is not only the fifth annual Black Women Lead Summit, but it also marks the 10th anniversary since the founding of All In Together. In that time, we have reached hundreds of thousands of women through programs like this and through our grassroots community leadership program. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Amazon Web Services, Bloomberg LP, HP, Merck, Omidyar Networks, P&G, T-Mobile, and Wiley, once again, for making this program possible. On your tables today, <laughs> on your tables today are copies of our 10-year impact report. I encourage you to take a look, and if today's program speaks to you, please get involved. We run programs across America and are always welcoming new, amazing women to our community. It is now my pleasure to welcome our first esteemed speaker of the day, Michelle Jawando, Senior Vice President and Head of Global Programs at Omidyar Network, an accomplished leader and visionary currently spearheading her organization's efforts to address critical issues such as the economy, technology, and belonging. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Michelle for being one of our first sponsors. She has been with us for over a decade, <laughs> and we're deeply grateful. Please welcome Michelle Jawando, who will introduce our first panel. Thank you. Okay, we, look, I am the daughter of an AME preacher and a lawyer. It was loud and noisy, a lot of debates. So we're gonna try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, and Simone and I are in the back trying to figure out whose Tesla that is. Okay, no shade, no shade. Um, so Nicole and our All In Together family, we are so excited to be here. We are so thankful to all of you for getting up early and being here at the beautiful Conrad. Um, our first panel of today really highlights what it means to be a black woman in leadership and philanthropy. Uh, black women, as you know, we have a long and rich history in philanthropy. And so much of that work and that commitment is really driven by our own internal values on equity and social justice. And I'm so excited because I have some of my team members and some of my grantees here from Omidyar Network, but so many of you in the audience are philanthropists in your own right. And I'm joined today with some of my sisters in philanthropy who are doing this great work. So please welcome to the stage award-winning executive director, Deetra Austin Everson, who's the chief executive officer of the John and Lillian Miles Foundation. Lillian Miles Lewis Foundation. Let me get that right. Come on. Thank you, Mr. Lewis, for everything you've done. Ms. Lawana Kimbrough, Managing Director of the Stardust Fund, a career advocate currently working to catalyze change, build power, and support thriving communities. Lawana. And joining us, Garnisha Ezidiaro of Bloomberg Philanthropies out of New York City. Thank you. All right, my sisters, it is so good to be here with you today. Um, you know, I want to just start from a, a, a personal place. I think so many of us are influenced to do the work that we do. Um, and to engage in our careers because of pivotal moments. For me, I think about my great aunt, who was the first woman attorney um, and really led social justice movements on this little tiny island of Bermuda. And she was later knighted by Queen Elizabeth um, because they couldn't stop her from like leading civil rights and social justice movements on the island. 
And so that work led me to law school and this deep career. And so I actually want to start with you, Garnisha, and ask what has motivated you to begin this career in philanthropy? First of all, good morning. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. We were backstage talking, and this is going to go quick because there's so much um, energy in this, in this group. I will say, um, you know, from the very start, I grew up in Atlanta and had the pleasure of seeing um, what Atlanta um, way back then had to offer, and that was uh, people who were coming together um, at every different income level. Um, and really, I always say we had a black mayor, black police chief, the, everybody um, was, was in charge, but more importantly, had a spirit of community and of service. And for me, that looked like my grandmother taking me to you know, work at church um, every Saturday morning um, to, to pack the meals and to do all of that um, type of work before Sundays. Um, but also it looked like um, community service from the start. And so service is a, a place that um, we've been in, and I say black people forever, um, just in how we move and how we think about life. But for me, philanthropy sort of um, came to bear much later in the career as a career path because I was working as a consultant um, in DC when a group of program officers across a lot of the major foundations, mostly black men, um, decided to have a covert like operation and bring black men to the agenda. Um, and out of that came a lot of funding from everything from film, the film industry, um, and, and films that were about black men to the campaign for black male achievement to, um, you know, some of this work um, to many efforts to even think about black men and reproductive rights. And I just saw the power in those folks coming together, not organized, not in a conference room, but on the side to make a decision that they were going to in their respective roles from their respective seats. Um, put black men on the agenda. And this was a work that happened, you know, 15, 20 years before then President Obama announced um, My Brother's Keeper. And people thought that that was a new effort, but that is something that had been a long time coming and were the ideas of some background conversation. So seeing that power, seeing that community, um, but having those values, you know, that were for me growing up in the city that I grew up in and the family that I grew up in was definitely um, the start to my career in philanthropy. Luana? Well, well, well. <laughs> you know it's a good story when it starts like Listen, that. Listen, you're lucky I can't sing because I go into Oh Happy Day. Uh, I, I want to also uh, send some gratitude for being in this room. I already feel taller and stronger being in a room with so many leaders. And I just want to say from the outset, we were the leaders we were waiting for. And so much of that edict is why, come on, yes, clap for yourself, clap for yourself. So, so much of that edict is why I am accidentally in philanthropy. We have similar trajectories. I started as a civil rights attorney representing kids who were condemned to die in the Black Belt South. And I got impatient with injustice, right? And, and I will say, uh, you know, they, they say fire shut up in your bones. I'm going to misquote that, but y'all know what I mean. And I'm Southern, so we do call and response. You get tired of being in the downstream when there weren't upstream solutions. And I accidentally joined philanthropy because I believe in radical redistribution of wealth, right? And I am from a rural town where uh, a, a working class family carried me on their backs to freedom. And I was frustrated they had to overcome so much and be so resilient. And I was tired of individual attributes um, being foisted upon us as a way to abdicate responsibility to change systems. And I, and I said, I want to be at the table um, where I can steward resources to the leaders who have always been standing in the breach, divested from and underfunded. And so it's, it is with that energy uh, that I came to philanthropy. And I, I know we'll get into it. But we are at a dire time. We were talking about this backstage where we have to double down because people have already believed that the rhetoric, right? The rhetoric from years ago means mission accomplished. 
when in fact there has been a retrenchment away from racial justice, our communities, and it is a critical time for us to speak up. You know, they say when you pray for courage, you don't get courage, you get an opportunity to be courageous. And I think this is this moment. And so that's why I'm in philanthropy. That's right. Luana. Dietra, you carry a mighty mantle for former congressman and civil rights icon, John Lewis. Tell us about your journey into philanthropy. Thank you. And good morning to everyone. My journey is a little bit different. I grew up in small town USA. And so what I learned very early uh, during that time uh, in Arkansas, anybody else is in from Arkansas here? Maybe not. Um, and so um, that's how small it is, you see? <laughs> and one of the things I recognized very early is that uh, many of the things that we had benefit of and access to in my community were based on people who had their name on buildings and who had given a lot of money. And so I learned about philanthropy from a space of it being able to provide resources. My mother was a social worker. So much of the work that she did to connect families and children to other resources was through people who were giving philanthropically and the programs and access and the arts center and things of that nature. So I saw that as my ability to have access to things came from people who were benevolent. And I made a choice that at some point I was going to focus on getting into that position. Now that was put on steroids when I joined and became a student at Spelman College. The very history of our college is based on philanthropy and, you know, from the individuals who gave and made sure that college was even in existence to this day. And so what I look at is the benefit of what philanthropy can do. I made a decision that it was what I was going to spend my career being a part of. You know, I want to talk a little bit about identity, right? Um, so often many of us are asked to choose between our various identities at work. Um, as a black woman, as a mother, as a sister, as a daughter, as a caregiver, um, as a pet mom. Um, we're asked to choose these various identities, but so many and so much of the work that we're able to do um, and do well is because of who we are and these, reach, uh, these rich and deep experiences. So Luana, I want to start with you. How do you feel like your experiences have helped you to be a more dynamic and thoughtful and inclusive philanthropist? Ooh, that's a, a great question. I will say, as I was listening to you teed up about asking ourselves to be separate and have different identities, many of us didn't have a choice to opt out of our identities, right? I don't get to opt out of my gender or blackness <laughs> and things of that nature. And we were saying um, backstage our disappointment around spaces that said, come to our shores. We value equity, we value inclusion, we value impacted leaders. And in some ways, and it's gonna be a little bit hard to say, but I know I'm gonna get some amen nods, is that our very, both our credentials, but our experiential um, existence has lent credibility to many of the places that we have been uh, brought to. And our disappointment in what, uh, there's gonna be a panel later today that talks about DEI, the retrenchment from it, because many people were brought in to say, hey, bring your full selves. We are at a point where we're gonna make sure that we are funding our values. And then we, uh, uh, many people were brought in, uh, tried to enact, stand up, right? And carry out those mandates in organizations that were not ready for the change, Come did on. not fund the change, and performance managed those brothers and sisters out. And so I would be remiss if I didn't say, I am so grateful to be able to fully show up. But, and by the way, this, it, this is particularly critical because if I had an overarching sort of mandate is a sort of deep abiding love for us. And I had been in spaces where I was told to have this passionate distance. And I don't believe any of the things that impact our communities require that. It's sort of the myth of objectivity. And so there is a gift to get to fully show up, to get to say to a room that you love us and you believe in us and you want to fund liberation, but it has not been costless. And so we represent people, and I don't want to speak out of turn, uh, but I, my ability to say this is a, actually a privilege of the place in which I work, where it, this was not the fate of some other people. There are people who had, you know, I don't have the moral high ground, I just have greater latitude. And so I think it's important to say as much as our identities inform how we fund, it has cost others um, who are even ostensibly told to come in the name of their communities. 
And Garnisha, I want to just put a little twist on it for you because you have a living donor. And so there are specific challenges that you and I both deal with. Um, how do you navigate both living into kind of the idea with such a big name philanthropy um, and some of the systemic challenges that you have to do by virtue of being the person you are? I think so. So the portfolio that I lead at Bloomberg Philanthropies is about uh, creating and accelerating black wealth for black families. While also, and we made this decision head on, thinking about the extraction of wealth out of our communities. And so those two things, and I know we're going to get into this later, um, by definition, are, are counter narratives because we sometimes we don't think about black people and wealth. And we definitely don't want to talk about the fact that it is systemic um, and has been for a long time, the removal of wealth from communities. I also work for some, a billionaire, um, who, uh, you all know, right? And so um, when we go into rooms and we start talking, there is a power dynamic that is already there. Um, there is a power dynamic from a, a funding standpoint, from just the wealth standpoint, from um, that most of folks that work across my foundation don't necessarily look like me. Um, we have members of, of the team here who do. Um, and so we have to, when, we, when, I, when I go back to your original question about identity, it's so important to take up space. And I know we say that with like a headline, but what I mean is making sure that we are asking the tough questions that no one else would ask if we weren't in the room. When people say things to us that um, are racist, when people say things to us that have one point of view, asking why are we only going with this point of view? What, when, when can we have the people that have been working on this for a long time in the room? What would you be saying if I wasn't here? And the, you know, like asking those questions. Um, and I use questions um, in, in my leadership style a lot. Um, because, I'm curious. <laughs> yes, I'm curious as to how did you arrive at that conclusion? Um, and, 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 I, and I will say that what I have appreciated um, about my living donor is he asks a lot of tough questions. He believes in data. But I can say to him, Mike, I don't believe that. And he'll say why. And we will go back and forth. But the girl from the South, the girl who um, has worked in Newark and New Orleans and is from Atlanta, um, brings that energy in those conversations because that's why I'm there, to bring my experience and my voice. And I also know, though, that there are many people who look like me who are in my organizations or in organizations across um, the country who can't necessarily or not yet at, their po at the point in their career where they have the confidence to take the risk to sit in front of a billionaire who also happens to be your boss and say, you're wrong, That's right. right? And I know that it takes a lot and I've had the coaching and the sisterhood and sometimes coming back to even my team and some of, some of the women that are sitting here saying, girl, do you know what I said? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, 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 you know, I also have to go back to myself at the end of the day and being to look at the mirror and saying, I did not miss the moment because I said the thing. That's right. Come right? on. And I Come challenged on. it and I stood for what I believe in. And, and shout out to my team over here who, who helped me when I say the thing. And I'm like, look, I might be fired later. Exactly. Um, so y'all just make sure y'all are on babysitting duty for my children. Um, Deetra, let me, let me turn to you because one of the things that we do at Omidyar is we're working on responsible technology and reimagining capitalism, but perhaps some of our most significant work is how do we build cultures of belonging? And Congressman John Lewis was often called the conscious of the Congress. And so you have this mantle, but this feels like such a polarized and fractured moment. How is your work building those connections and those spirits and the kind of legacy of bringing the consciousness that we need today. That is a lot. <laughs> what but you're first, a Spelman woman. So you I, what I first want to say and walking in all of that is thank you for the women who are doing exactly the example that Congressman Lewis pushed us to do. He said, be the person who will speak up and speak out. Those are things that we heard. He left an amazing book in his uh, final book, Carry On, that talked about how to carry on the work that he led and so many others supported and gave their life work to. And so for me, it's important that we continue to 
be in those spaces. We owe it to environments we go in to show up as our authentic selves. One, I believe because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I believe we leave out the opportunity for other people to understand and know everything that has been placed in us through our experiences, lived, and, and who we are as a person. And so if we don't do that, we're doing a disservice by being in those spaces. And you're right, the mantle um, and the example that Congressman Lewis left us was one that is important for you to be willing to be vulnerable enough to share yourself with other people to the point that either they become uncomfortable enough to want to learn more or they start getting comfortable and continue to learn more. And so I think those are things that we have to continue to do. And it, it is a huge mantle, but we are all carrying that. And so wherever you go, please remember to do just that. Uh, give the environment you're in the ability to benefit from everything and all that you are. Mm. So there are some gems. I hope you're writing them down. And I also really want to quickly shout out Lauren and All In Together for bringing this panel of super women together. Um, that's what allyship is supposed to look like. So we've already said that we're getting together. And so we want to be intentional about being in spaces that see us and see the value of these connections. I'm going to do a speed round here because there's so many gems coming off this stage. Um, and we have so many questions. There's so many things we want to talk about. So I'm going to do a speed round. Um, I want to start with Luana. Where can philanthropy be better? How can we show up better, especially around issues around racial justice, health for black women today? Listen, and that's a speed round question. <laughs> that could be an <laughs> old day it. answer. That, that was her cold word, but keep it short, ladies. <laughs> Listen, and I'm a black woman from the South and a litigator. You know it's not going to be quick. Give early, often, and agilely. Um, there is a, and I'm going to say this with just sort of like a split mind around it. There's sort of this um, larger ethos of scarcity that is actually not borne out by the number. Um, there have been things that have been proven time and time again not to be efficacious, and we pour hundreds of millions of dollars into it. We have said we cared about sort of a value, you know, um, evidence-based giving, and sometimes that has just been used as a barrier to be inert, right? We're going to study something forever. We were talking earlier about direct cash assistance and health. We have known for millennia that right-in-time cash can, can save communities, but we still make people study that. Right. And so there's some, you know, truth and reconciliation that has to go in how we've been funding communities, racial justice issues and the like. Um, one of the things I'll just say, and I and I heard you say speech, so I'm going to go quickly through it, is I'm really proud of having learned from others like Crystal Haling at Libra, Shonda Chapman and Miss about how to quickly dispense funds and, and reduce the bureaucracy that we make leaders and organizations go through. We have a paperless process because I don't believe in taking people off the field, right, who have already been leading to explain to me or to shoehorn into a grant making process their intervention, right? And so um, reducing the bureaucratic bar barriers of getting money and then also getting it out quickly has made all the difference. I'll, I'll say this other thing that is important about where we are in the funding landscape. Um, a lot of times the big oak trees get the dollars and that's important because sometimes you need cornerstone anchored organizations to continue to be funded. But I love funding what I call the flora on the forest floor at promise nascent organizations who are really doing the work, but can never attract large dollars because money begets money. You have to show you had capacity to get more. But how do you ever do that if no one um, takes or you know, funds you? And it's usually talked about in terms of risk. And I think we have to change that narrative. It is not risky to fund the movement leaders who have already been doing the work and have been divested from. And so like the future, to answer your question of how we think through racial justice and the whole sort of milieu of issues that impact us is to actually do liberatory financing. Get the dollars out of the door and double down because we may not have another five years. And so I fund as if all the money's gonna drop tomorrow. Garnisha, tell me a little bit about some of those narratives that you have to contend, particularly when you're talking about Black people and wealth, and how do you disrupt that? I think the first um, 
issue and challenge. Um, but And I'll also, let me say this in context of, of celebrating all the work that has been done. When we um, started, um, Mike actually made a commitment to this coming out of his presidential campaign before the racial reckoning, um, which, which I do give a lot of credit for because he didn't have to. He didn't have to say, hey, let's start this new body of work and this new portfolio about um, black wealth. And when we started, we, we brought together people, um, some of the top activists, folks who've been doing this work for a long time. And a lot of that conversation was about prosperity. And everybody was talking about bringing black people from the bottom. And it was very difficult. And it's a, it's a constant thing that we have to correct for in that we're talking about wealth, with a function, which is a function of ownership. And that is a, a, a completely different thing. It's also about power, and we, we talked about that backstage. But you know, everybody so often, just like people say, every time people say black businesses, they say small businesses. And so there's ways that we use language and there's ways that we reinforce smallness um, when we are talking about black people and black communities. And these are things that we're constantly fighting from working with partners across our organization to think about the words that we're putting out, to convening folks in the field to really challenge what are the narratives that even the people that are working on this are consistently reinforcing that are limiting the span of possibilities to what we can fund. Our first funding out of the gate was a $100 million investment to the four historically black medical schools. It was a height of the pandemic. We were hearing from them that we were gonna lose potentially lose black doctors who work so hard, I was gonna use other language, um, <laughs> to get to the point where they were in medical school. And there was this question of like, well, why not give scholarships? Why not commit them to have to work in community? And I was like, well, first of all, they're already there. So our team was really saying, we, are, we need to pay off the debt. This debt can be a barrier to putting them in agency and choice about where they work and how they work in the future. And that is contextually different than a scholarship. That is, that is a whole different you know, ball game. And so those are the ways that we have to continually be in conversation, think about black worth, think about black communities in, in a completely different context than a poverty mindset and like bringing us from the bottom because a lot of us um, are in very different places and there's so many assets that we have to build from. Future, that same question on narratives. What are some of the narratives you're contending with in your work? In the work that I do, I have the joy um, and excitement of being able to do work that is led by someone that, um, has done such a phenomenal job using his life. Both Congressman Lewis and his wife Lillian uh, spent their lives being purposeful uh, in everything they did. And so what I focus on, it, it's kind of a benefit. I get to continue to push forward those narratives of being able to live life purposefully, finding ways in which to leave this world better than where we found it, being in a position to be unapologetic about working on those things. And so I feel like I'm in this, this wonderful bubble of being able to go out and do work that I care so deeply about, but also I feel like I have a license to do it because of the name of our organization. And, uh, and I want to do and pay uh, great homage to what Congressman Lewis and his wife Lily has done. The thing that I want to point out here that I love, when you're talking about the Black Women Lead Conference, many times we don't think about the females. Um, who lead. Lillian Miles Lewis was a woman and a force to be reckoned with all on her own. And much of the time when you hear Congressman Lewis talk about her, he talks about the fact of all that he accomplished and the many great things he got a chance to go out and do. And so I would say, always be mindful that no matter where you sit, you're sitting in a position of power and you have the ability to influence and lead, even if you're not out front. And so for me, I want to make sure we walk away knowing that that's the energy and spirit I show up with every day. And no matter what narrative is I'm dealing with or shaping, I push forward that narrative that I have the ability to make a difference. And I'm standing on the shoulders of two people who made significant difference in our community and our nation. I love it. All right. So we are getting ready to close this panel and bring to an end. I want you to give me one prompt that you would put into chat GPT or Claude AI about the power of black women and philanthropy. And we're going to go down the line. Garnisha. I was about to say, sorry, 
What do you want people to walk away with? I would, I want people to walk away um, sort of going back to what we said before, um, the, the, the prompt to not to chat GPT, but to ourselves to be what, what is there that you have to give and that you want to give that only you can give? All right, Luana. Ooh, that's a word. I would say uh, unequivocally that we are not just enough. We are what what's called for, right? You matter in these rooms. Deetra. I think what I would leave with it is a service is a superpower. And I think we need to continue to believe that. And so it should push us to do more. And I will leave you with our great big sister, Angela Davis. You have to believe that we can do the impossible and you have to believe it every single day. Ladies, we are so thankful you are here. Let's give a round of applause to my sisters. Thank you.